Hey, good morning again, and Frank will let me know if I'm actually coming on the sound. Okay, good, good. Uh, this is a very special day. We're very glad that we can uh, be together. Glad everyone can be with us. We have some uh, special moments. Uh, one of the things that will be uh, hearing in just a couple of minutes, uh, something sneaks by us most every year, and that is the anniversary of our congregation. And uh, there's a, uh, we, uh, we had a birthday in the last few days of August, and so uh, we have something to commemorate that, that Sylvia will share with us at the end of these uh, opening announcements. Uh, just a reminder, the Kids Club is going on, and that's happening at the uh, downstairs with uh, good leaders and just a great time. Um, dinner and a movie starts next week, and uh, yeah, wow. Uh, on Saturday night, um, the movie is I Still Believe, which is really worth seeing. And, uh, you know, a great meal. And just a reminder, this is an opportunity for us to reach out. Whether you invite somebody to come and maybe meet some of your friends. Um, but, or also, just make sure that you have conversations with those around you. And especially if somebody's not from the church or whatever. You know, a lot of folk are just very glad to have a good meal at a great price. We very much thank uh, our team that Donna's organized and, uh, and leads that puts on this, this, uh, this real service to the community. But let's use it for gospel advance, advancement. Next Sunday, when we still have the great taste of the pork roast simmering in the bellies, uh, will be our VBS reunion. It's, it's, it's a multi-purpose day, but one of the things will be every uh, young person that took part in Vacation Bible School, we're going to have them invite them all to come and we, Looking forward to having a little snippet of what went on in our class, uh, in the classes, um, from, especially from the songs that they'll share with us. And they were quite catchy and quite enjoyable. So that'll be going on. Nursery will start up there too, and uh, we need volunteers. So uh, you'll have the opportunity to see Sarah Fuller up front very quickly, and, or, or, or before the hour is over. And uh, make sure you speak to her about your willingness to help make nursery happen. Hey, you get to play with the kids a little bit, and you also get to help a young mom who could probably use an hour of rest to just soak in the message of God's love. Um, Sunday school teachers are still needed, and there is an informational meeting on the 7th, which is Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. At 7.30 p.m. will be the deacons meeting. Seven, seven, seven. Very good. Okay, also on the 12th will be the Sunday school kickoff. Now that means the classes will begin, but it also means that there'll be lunch and games in the backyard. Now because of uh, COVID rules, let's each bring our own picnic baskets, or if you prefer, picnic baskets. So, <laughs> so, so that, will be, that will be going on. Grades and Grace will start up on the 15th. We're just really launching it all, aren't we? And that'll be Wednesday <laughs> at the 15th at 5 p.m. Meets in the, in the uh, fellowship hall always needing uh, volunteers, but also sponsors for the meal. You know, kids like to eat, have you noticed? And uh, part of what makes this an attractive time is that we provide them with meals. It doesn't have to be pizza all the time. Um, they haven't complained, but uh, we can also provide them with other meals, kid-friendly meals. But uh, if you'd like to do that for a week, again, catch Sarah, please, for that. Uh, tech team is always in need of more folk, and so we invite you to uh, be there for that. Uh, talk to Frank and help put that on. And then two announcements that aren't in the bulletin. First of all, that there will be a small group facilitators meeting in the fellowship hall at 7.30 p.m. on this Wednesday. Um, so please be there. David and Sue have uh, important stuff for us to share and an opportunity as we look forward to this uh, fall's emphasis on prayer. And then, as mentioned or promised, um, this is a a day to celebrate our anniversary as a congregation. One more candle on the cake, and it would have to be a big cake. Um, but uh, to share something from um, the devotional uh, that the church produced a few years ago called Where Two or Three Are Gathered, uh, Sylvia, as our historian, would you come forward, please? Or past historian, I guess.
This congregation has just passed its 273rd anniversary. Imagine you're not in this beautiful church building. You're sitting in a barn. <laughs> you're sitting on a bench with no back. And it's probably hot, but you're excited because this is the first gathering of the Second, uh, second Parish West Pembroke Society. Hmm. You've been traveling many miles each Sunday to Pembroke, but no community, but our community has grown large enough to support a pastor and a church. Attendance is mandatory. <laughs> you will attend. <laughs> and the travel was hard. This day's pastor is from Pembroke Congregation and many Pembroke members are here to wish the new gathering well. Mm. This church was gathered in love. Mm. The new pastor, Reverend Gad Hitchcock from Springfield has been hired, but he and his family won't arrive until October. Then we move on in time. Before winter set in, a lean-to was built on the south side to cover for the horses as they came each, each Sunday morning. Teenage boys were responsible to unhitch the horses, feed them, and get to the service on time. <laughs> the barn meeting uh, had no, the barn meeting house had no heat, so pe people had to dress warmly. On November 18, 1755, a great earthquake hit this area. Mm. Damage to the church building was minimal, but some homes were seriously damaged. The members rallied to help the other members. Hmm. By 1797, the population had grown and the building was no longer large enough. It was sawed in half and the back half was moved 14 feet back. And then a new middle added. <laughs> That's one way to enlarge, isn't it? <laughs> in 1803, the bell tower was added and a new bell was purchased from England. This was too small and could not be heard all over town. In 1807, this, was, this one was traded for a bigger one, the one we have today. Uh, teenage boys were honored to be asked to learn how to ring the bell now the bell could be heard and all the people would be called for Sunday morning or other services. The bell would also be rung at 6 a.m. to inform anyone that someone had died. The bell would ring one bong for each year the person had lived. Hearers would know then for whom the bell tolled. In 1833, the Massachusetts Constitution was amended to read that people were no longer required to attend church, and they were no longer required to pay the taxes for the church. Some people saw doom and gloom for the future of the congregation, but God had other plans for our survival. In 1836, the old building was in need of many repairs and people decided it was time to build a new one and it was built on this same site. It was dedicated December 14, 1836. This is our building today. I look around and I imagine ladies in their long dresses, men in their Civil War uniforms ready to leave for duty, other uniforms for other wars. We've had happy times and sad times. This meeting house has served us well, and God has blessed us with 273 for this birthday. We've had 38 pastors to lead us on this journey. Happy birthday. Mary Lou, you can go ahead. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch sh uh, shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge. 
His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down to the kid, and the little child shall lead them. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Remain standing for our song. This song is called In Christ Alone, and I'm wondering um, what you are relying on this morning. Maybe you're relying on your physical body and your strength to accomplish whatever it is. Or maybe you're relying on your mental ability to, to uh, sort of um, persevere through. Or maybe you're relying on your financial status or maybe on your, um, your own self, your own life. And I'll tell you, it falls short. We can't do it. In Christ alone do we have what we need. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died. forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine caught with the precious
You may be seated. One of the very special reasons for today's being such a positive and powerful day is that we get to celebrate the licensure of Sarah Fuller Marcolino. That will come up in a little bit, but I didn't want to neglect that. Um, we do hope that, uh, that just we recognize this special thing. Licensing a pastor, by the way, is sort of, well, I don't want to just call it ordination light, but there's a sense to which it recognizes the preparation that someone has had and um, that God's hand is upon them for ministry, but also recognize a little bit of provisional status. It's something that gets superseded eventually by ordination. That's the plan, right, Sarah? <laughs> so that's part of our Thanksgiving this morning as we pray. And as always, in addition to the, uh, the prayer of emails, and if you need to connect with that email chain, see Jane afterward and she'll hook you up with that. But you can also just see me and say, hey, let's make sure we add this to our prayers. Join with me now, won't you? Lord of the harvest, we thank you that you call workers into the harvest. Thankful that we've seen your hand on Sarah as she has grown and that we can celebrate her licensure today. We ask that you bless her ministry and fill her with every good gift of the Spirit that she may faithfully perform uh, the tasks and calling you have for her. Help us each to seek the filling of your spirit that we might have the gifts to serve you, that we would do so obediently. And would you, Lord, use this church as your instrument that more may hear, may know, may live, may put roots down deep into the rich soil of your love and grace. We thank you for your care. Lord, we lift you all those who face struggles with health. We're mindful of kind of a two, two Americas and, and two parts of the same world. Those who are protected from COVID and those who are really in its grip. More children cases of it now than there's ever been. We ask, Lord, for your grace, your moving within the hearts of men and women to be wise, for there to be a singularity of information, for us to obey your scripture and uh, live in submission to the human authorities, that you do not allow anyone to come into power except by your hand for your purpose. And so, Lord, help us to be humble. And, Lord, bring a relief and an end to this scourge, we pray. We also pray, Lord, for your hand upon Karen Farrell, who has very difficult pain, the protruding disc. We pray for wisdom regarding surgery, for when it's to be done, what is to be done, who is to do it, how they are to do it but that you would bring relief for Karen and to all who are struggling alongside with her and just hurt to see her hurt. We also pray for Phil Brides, Lord, that you would uh, bring relief to the uh, shortness of breath he's been experiencing, that you'd bless Joan and all those who are eager to see dear Phil uh, recover well. And Lord, hold in your care those who are grieving especially Ron, the family and friends of Ron Carlson, including our Mary Ann Johnson, Ron's her brother-in-law. Put your mercy on them, Lord, and bring the assurance of one whose faith was in you um, is safe in your care now. Also, Lord, for family and friends of Mike Marciona, would you hold them in your care and bring relief to their grief as well. Remember, Lord, those recovering from the earthquake in Haiti, those seeking to bring relief there, that you would bless that. We pray for um, a change of system, that there might be righteousness in leadership, and that they might truly serve the people. We lift to you the situation in Afghanistan, especially praying 
for those uh, refugees seeking safety. We pray for a, an end to lawlessness. We pray for just leadership for the country. And we also ask, Lord, for your provision, comfort, help to those rebuilding after Hurricane Tropical Storm Ida, wherever they were in its swath, that rebuild would be safe, that um, health could be maintained, power restored. And we do pray, Lord, as our young people and, and the teachers and others return to school this year, that your hand would be upon each one. We pray for health and safety for each one. We pray for wisdom among those who've had to add such a public health burden to their uh, job description, to, uh, to have wisdom, to know what to do. And we pray, Lord, that young people might learn truth about your grace, your love, and that the image of a world that would try to push you out would be removed. That we would recognize that we all need you. And I thank you, God, that we do uh, gather in a place where believers have gathered for so long and we're mindful of those who even came before that, that we are recipients of a grand chain relay race and the baton of your gospel has been passed to us. Help us to run well the race set before us and to carry proudly the news that Christ has died, has risen, has come again to give us the rescue we need from ourselves. And in Christ alone, we take our hope. And as he has taught us, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Even the reminder of 273 years is a reminder of God's blessing on this congregation, God's blessing on each one of us. We are here. We are alive. We have the ability to get here. We are, or you're able to be with us by a technology that was unknown of, unknown, uh, 20 or more years ago. God is faithful. And you know the blessings he's given to you. And so we respond to those blessings with our offerings, baskets in the back, folk mail them in, folk use uh, the donate tab on our website. There's even a QR code in the racks in front of you that uh, donations can be made. However we donate, we are responding to the goodness of God and we are trusting him. And by uh, freely parting with what culture around us acts like it's the most important thing in the world, by offering it to God, we are saying God comes first. Let us dedicate our gifts to God. Lord, we honor you. You are the one from whom all blessings flow. You are the one who gives us strength for each new day. You are the one who gives us life and hope. So we give you these gifts. We ask that you would bless them to fulfill your purposes, that your message in word and deed would come forth from every aspect of our ministry together. And would you cause each of us to use well, as good stewards, the resources you put in our life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
This morning's lesson is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 7 through 12. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall not see light. I'm sorry. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with his transgressions, transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. You did fine. We do put the tough words in there just for you, Mary. It's, it's, uh... We're just going to start out by talking about suicide prevention. If someone speaks or acts in a way that demonstrates they are feeling seriously helpless and hopeless... Ask them if they are thinking about taking their own life. Put another way, if someone feels as if their living situation is unlivable, with no realistic expectation of ever getting better, they will ask themselves, don't worry, you're not introducing the idea into their minds. Should I just end it all? This isn't a class on intervention. But if that is the case with a loved one, stay with them and call for help. We can talk more if this is touching something you're dealing with. But sometimes just realizing that they have someone who cares that much about them will help them see that their life is better than their depression had led them to believe. In prayer, I referred to this kind of aggressive push against Christian faith that permeates our culture. Made me think, what has happened to suicide rates in America? After all, they say they're acting for our benefit. Well, it's no secret that fewer Americans attend worship every week now than a generation ago or 250 years ago when it was compulsory. (laughs) But no matter what Christian church you attend, you're still likely to hear that because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, Christians have help now and hope for the future and hope for the hereafter. So in post-Christian America, are people getting help and hope from somewhere else? Well, there's absolute unanimity on this question. The CDC, CBS, and the New York Times all agree that the United States has one of the highest suicide rates among all wealthy nations. In 2018, note the year, the number of recorded suicides was up 15% from 2014. The annual rate in the U.S. increased 24% from 1999 to 2014, the highest rate recorded in 28 years. Due to the stigma surrounding suicide, it's suspected that suicide itself is actually underreported. Because of the deaths of despair, suicide, drug overdoses, and alcoholism, for three years, ending in 2018, 
there was a decline in life expectancy for the U.S. Those were the contributors. It's easy to see that advancing suicide rates show hope to be our culture's dire need. And that's all before COVID. When COVID came on the scene, we're isolating people from the support and encouragement that is so important to overcoming addictions and personal struggles with self-esteem. It's getting worse. Christians, the world needs what we have. The world needs to know the one we know. Cover to cover, the Bible story is convenient. I'm sorry, it's consistent. It's convenient, but (laughs) inconvenient if you want to keep sinning, but (laughs) on topic. The Bible study is consistent. Its story is consistent. That God is active and loving. That God did not abandon the human race to destroying ourselves and each other. He didn't leave us there. For his battle of redemption, God established a beachhead among an obscure people, the Jews, who had no other claims to greatness. God preserved them, established them in a land, and told them that he would bless all the world through them. The prophecies intensified, and soon the entire nation was on tiptoe with anticipation for the deliverer whom God would send. Because Jesus did come, and clear evidence was given by him of his identity as the Son of God, the unique Son of God. We have a help and a hope as believers the world cannot give us. The world doesn't do a good job of it. So this morning, I want to help us see that our grasp on hope strengthens when we hold an unknown future with God's unshakable promises. Hold an unknown future, it's unknown, with God's unshakable promises. I met this week with Jeremy, a pastor who's planting a new church in downtown Hyannis on the Cape. The church is called Seven Mile Road. Odd name, right? But it gets its name from the sermon text that uh, I'm going to share with us. Late in the day on the first Easter Sunday, Jesus, with his identity somehow hidden from the men he encounters, came upon two men who are walking the seven miles from Jerusalem to a village named Emmaus. Follow along with me as I read Luke 24, 17 to 26. He said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, and answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, It is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some of the women of our group astonished us. They are at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us they had seen, indeed, a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah, or Christ, should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? (laughs) Although we only hear from one of the two disciples, it's evident they are both struggling to figure out what has happened. Haven't you ever asked 
What is God up to? Years ago, a cartoon figured, featured an old-time country preacher who's having a crisis of faith right in the pulpit. And he whispers a prayer heavenward, saying, God, I'm, I'm really in trouble here. I feel so alone. Are you there? If, if I could just have a sign, that would help me to keep going. There's a flash of lightning, a crack of thunder, and when the dust clears, the preacher is holding a no parking sign. And he says, I don't know what it means, but I think I feel better. (laughs) Now, Cleopas is right there. Now, he wants to know what it all means. Now, over the course of just a few sentences, Cleopas says a mouthful. Those seven days that we call Holy Week were so cataclysmic that he asks this stranger, are you the only man living in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on in these days? And Jesus, cool as a Mediterranean cucumber, (laughs) says, what's going on? Do you have someone in your life who, if you ask them one question, the conversation is set for a half hour? (laughs) Now, I don't know if Cleopas is like that usually, but he was that day. And that's okay, because they've got seven miles to cover. We can divide what Cleopas said into three sections. First, he described the phenomenon of Jesus and of his life. You might have noted the phrase, a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. What Jesus did and said was astonishing. To the people, and it was clearly blessed by God. And what Jesus did, no one could do on their own. God's hand was on him. It's all there in the sentence, mighty in deed and word in the presence of God and all the people. What does it cover? Feeding the 5,000, healing the sick, raising the dead, teaching the ways of God in powerfully unprecedented ways. He was an absolute phenomenon. Now, this passage is already saturated with irony. We have Jesus compassionately listening to a, disci- to a disciple describe Jesus to Jesus as if Jesus had never met Jesus. In the context of the disciple's profound grief over the death and loss of Jesus when Jesus is right there in front of him bit of irony. But in the second section, Cleopas adds some of the irony he witnessed. He describes the passion of our Lord from the betrayal in the garden all the way through to the crucifixion. And in contrast to the evidence found in the reading that Mary Lou gave us from the prophet Isaiah, which is a top-down, heaven's-eye view, this description of the crucifixion is absolutely horizontal viewed without the aid of God's perspective, viewed with the what is God up to kind of thinking. In Cleopas' story, all we have is bitter irony. The chief priests, one would have hoped would have known better, they're the ones who handed Jesus over to the Roman authority. To have him, to have Jesus, who should have received the highest honor as the one destined to to redeem Israel, have him executed by what can only be called cruel and unusual punishment. If viewed horizontally, the crucifixion is a horrendous tragedy. So we've heard all about Jesus as a man and about the apparent tragedy of his death. Well, in the third section, after the, after the crucifixion, at the moment of this passage from Luke, they're still gathering data. What does it mean? Cleopas describes the rumor at this stage of the resurrection. That morning, some of the women went to the tomb, came back saying they didn't find Jesus' body, but they encountered angels who said Jesus was alive. Some of the men went to the grave, found it also empty, but nothing else. Now, telling him that, can't you just picture the two guys looking at Jesus and making some 
broad gesture of confusion? What happened? What's going on? Got an idea? We can learn a lot from Jesus' reaction here. Perhaps because, or precisely because, of our dire need for hope. If our lives have too few signs of hope in them, could it be that we too often rush ahead like gerbils on a wheel without pausing to look at our lives from heaven's perspective? The scriptures give us heaven's perspective. Do you ever notice how often Jesus does the unexpected? And I don't just mean the miraculous. But think drawing in the sand. Caring for his mother while hanging on a cross. Jesus routinely does the unexpected. That's because Jesus always looked at life from a heavenly perspective. And he does that here. While Cleopas and his companions still have their shoulders shrugged, Jesus says, of course, don't you see? Uh, no. (laughs) Wasn't it necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter his glory? Isn't this the way things had to go down? Then he explained to them, from the revealed word of God, why what happened had happened. This fits God's story. This was the script Isaiah had written for Jesus to live out. Jesus, Messiah, crucified and risen. One of the passages that was certainly in Jesus' lesson, using up more of this seven-mile walk, is often called the suffering servant. All of Isaiah 53, and really some of 52 also. We didn't have time to include everything. Verse 1 finds God calling him my servant. And we heard how for the transgression of my people he was delivered to death. The death had to happen but wasn't the end of the plan, never had been. And here it is written down 700 years before Christ. Isaiah had continued, it pleased the Lord to make the servant's soul an offering for sin. Well, at least the death was redemptive, but hadn't death still won at that stage? But Isaiah wasn't done. He said the servant shall see offspring. He shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This is after how Isaiah had described in detail God's anointed servant, Messiah, would die and how he would be buried. The death and the resurrection with the surrounding emotions of confusion and betrayal, it's all there in the prophets. It's what Jesus is explaining as they walk along. The death was essential Jesus was crucified in order to take the bullet for us. We deserved it. The cross fulfilled the climax of the story God had been writing all along. What else did it fulfill? Since the days of Abraham, lambs had been sacrificed. Young, valuable, innocent. As an offering for the forgiveness of sins. So the people would know they've gotten right with God. Valuing lambs, the value they're given as as offering, is kind of arbitrary. I mean, why lambs and not salamanders? The lambs were symbols. They were looking forward to the finest man to ever live. He would pay, by virtue of his infinite value, as the unique son of God, the penalty that you and I and all who will ever believe in him Oh, our souls are in debt for our sins. We need to make reparation for our offenses against God. He takes that bullet for us. How great his love to do that. And as surely as the death was part of God's plan, Messiah crucified, so was the Messiah being risen to declare victory. 
Victory over evil is having the last word. There's hope to improve our situation. Victory over death being our destiny. Hope to improve our situation. Victory over hopelessness. The Easter resurrection is God's bugle call of reveling, calling every drowsy soul to rise up from our comas of helplessness and hopelessness. We have powerful help and living hope. There will be darkness, no surprise, but dawn is certain. Now, I've been richly blessed by reading N.T. Wright's book. It's simply called Paul. Wright makes it clear that you can't understand the most important mortal in the largest people movement in history, Paul, if you don't understand the experience and message of the first century Christian. His experience is further proof that our hope is well-founded and certain. One of the pieces of evidence is spontaneous communities of believers. Why and how did the Christian movement become so powerful so quick with no visible means of support? The book of Acts, written by the same Luke who wrote our gospel lesson, invites us to watch as Paul establishes in city after city little cells of unlikely people, many of them non-Jewish, and fires them with a joyful hope that binds them together. When Paul told the story of Jesus. Time after time, a sizable number of people found that this Jesus became a living presence, not simply a name from recent past. See, Jesus invites us to have a relationship with him, and he leaps out of the pages of the Bible and becomes a resident in our heart, a friend who never leaves us, a guide and a protector. There was a transformation among those who heard and believed. If you read the book of Acts, you will see for yourself that these first believers discovered what we need to know. That our grasp on hope strengthens as we hold an unknown future with God's unshakable promises. Wright has a uh, beautiful passage about how the message and reality of Jesus transformed the lives of those who had until then known no hope. This is what he wrote. It must have been a bit like the first person to realize that notes sounded in sequences created melody, that notes sounded together created harmony, and that ordering the sequence created rhythm. If we can think of a world without music and then imagine music being invented, offering a hitherto undreamed of depth and power to to space, time, and matter, then we may have a sense of the crazy magnitude of the message Paul had been called to spread. The gospel introduced music to a world, a melody to a world without music. Within these communities of believers, there was an awesome freedom from despair. They knew where their hope came from. Because of what Jesus had done, these believers were no longer cogs in Roman machinery. There are many different systems where the powerless have their significance robbed of them until their only purpose is to serve the powerful. Slaves and such were certainly that. They were in this situation in the days where the gospel was first proclaimed. But the gig economy threatens to make many of our neighbors such today. Then and now, we need to live out God's truth and help those whose lives we can impact discover meaning, purpose, and joy as they grow fully into what God made them to be. Uh, Secondly, they are no longer rats in destiny's cage. But I'm saying here the captor is destiny. I'm saying that in both the first and the 21st centuries, there was this thought virus more dangerous than COVID-19. The virus is the poison thinking that says, my life is what's been dealt with me. There isn't much I can do about it. It's what I got. That's why astrology is not innocent, by the way. 
your life controlled by stars? Not if Jesus has anything to say about it. And he does. The resurrection sets us free. Our first Christian brothers and sisters, and we, have this in common. We're no longer rats in destiny's cage. And finally, those Christians realize they're no longer refuse disposed of by those with earthly power. Think of the galley slave sentenced to spend the rest of his life rowing for the royal galley ships. Get a cramp and want to slow down? That's an invitation for the driver's whip. Your life only had value when you could furnish propulsion. Don't get hurt. It was good to return to all-American assisted living and care for the residents there. Too many of our elder neighbors today have too few visitors. We must continue to communicate that every man, woman, and child of every age has value regardless of their performance level. Jesus, crucified and risen, offers hope to all. With Christ, we can face an unknown future because it is known and dealt with inside God's unshakable promise. I read this week about a man named Victor, with a K. He ran an international drug operation in Central Asia, Tajikistan, places like that. He was good at it, but he got caught with four kilo of heroin on him and was immediately arrested and jailed. And in jail, as his sentence wore on, his state of mind deteriorated. I felt empty inside. I didn't want to live anymore. And a jailmate offered him a copy of the Gospel of John. Victor didn't touch the book at first. But after ten nights of poor sleep, he finally picked up the book and began to flip through it. And at first, the Bible made very little sense to Victor. But the strangest thing happened, because after more sleepless nights... He once again turned to the Bible, and this time he couldn't stop reading. And as he read, Victor began to feel God's presence. I didn't know about prayer, he said, but I called out to Jesus, saying, you know I'm not sure you exist. Jesus doesn't mind kind of a collect call. But I want eternal life, and I want to be born again. I continued reading in the Bible alone in my cell with no Christians around. He continued to read, to sense and enjoy God's presence. He was faced with the temptations of drugs being brought into prison. That's very common. And he looked at the drugs and realized they were the instrument of death. I can go back there, but they'll kill me. He says, looking at the gospel, I know that it was life. I made the decision to choose life. I sent the drugs back. After completing his sentence, Victor returned to his family, and began a church. You know, there it can't be formally registered. He uh, operates out of a barn. Hmm, heard about that, didn't I? But uh, they, they actually, visibly, they uh, sell farm products, but they also store resources for evangelism. What I was stunned at, what happened to me, is after I had written this, I told you I met with this pastor, Jeremy, that was after I'd written this. And he told me about his father, who was from uh, New Bedford, who got into trouble, served five years in prison. Father-in-law, excuse me, his father-in-law. Met Jesus in the prison. And when he, uh, when he was served his term, they, they gave him a bus ticket anywhere he wanted in the continental U.S. Not worth five years in prison, but it's not bad. And he went to Miami to go to a Christian college there. He met this pastor's uh, future mother-in-law. And then they returned, and he uh, has served as a prison chaplain, first with our friend Danny Cross in Plymouth, and now on, in Barnstable. So it's very interesting. This happens time and time again. Prisons, we think of as places without hope. But it becomes a place where hope can break through. You know, there's, there's risk for this fellow Victor in Central Asia. There's risk for all who preach the gospel. But Victor says the greater risk is to be caught up in the instruments of death. He has found, as we need to, 
that we needn't face an unknown future with fear, losing our grip. In fact, our grasp on hope strengthens when we hold an unknown future with God's unshakable promises. Let's pray. Lord, hopelessness is epidemic around us. And a mask won't save us. Lord, we need your grace. We need your power. And you offer it. Help us to speak your words of hope. To testify to the hope and help you've given us that with those who are facing life without that hope, that they might learn and choose a better way. Help us, Lord, to live as little Christs, resembling the grace, the kindness, the compassion and the heaven-sent power of Jesus who gives us hope and help for every, every moment and every future. In his name we pray. Amen. This time I'd like to invite a few folk forward for something very special. I'd like to invite our... our Deacon chairs, Carrie and uh, Skip, to come forward, please. And also, a deacon who has something to do with this, Kathy Fuller, come on up. And Sarah Fuller Marcolino, would you come forward? Carrie, would you help me pull this forward? There you go. Uh, yeah. Shall I read this? Could you? Read you, this. Would you? Yeah. Uh, to all, praise God whom all holy vows are made. Blessed are the mortals whom God calls to his service, that they may dwell among God's people as their servant. The harvest is bountiful, but the workers are few. We pray the Lord of the harvest to kindle the desire of many to consecrate themselves to his service. We invite Sarah or Marcolino to come forward to be recognized as a licensed minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ calls some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Before you stands one who has heard and answered God's call. Your board of deacons have inquired diligently into her sincerity, competence, and spiritual experience, and as your agents have given their approval. Sarah Fuller Marcolino. Do you sincerely profess yourself to be a follower of Christ, a student of the Holy Scriptures, a person of prayer, and a, royal con and a loyal congregational Christian? I do. Do you covenant with this people, this people of God, to serve them as their licensed minister, performing all the duties which this church shall commit into your care with diligence and devotion? In view of all this, I invite you all to participate in the affirmation of Sarah Fuller Marcolino as a licensed minister among us by standing as you are able and joining in the words that hopefully show up on the screen. Yes. <laughs> Let's say them together. Sarah, you are now approved as a licensed minister and admonished to study to show yourself approved by God as a worker who never needs feel ashamed rightly divided the word of truth. Let us pray. 
And deacons, would you uh, join me with the laying on of hands for sir? Almighty God, we do pray your blessing and empowerment upon Sarah as your servant. In her duties and calling as youth and family ministries leader among us, would you give her grace to speak your word in season and out, to live with compassion and grace. We pray your blessing on her home life with Bruno, that you would give them grace in the ordering of their affairs, that you protect their health and their home, that you would have your hand upon Sarah in her studies, help her to glean well the truth and helpful tools that are there for her. Continue to bless your ministry in her and among her. And help us as people calling her to service among us to support and encourage her with our actions, with our finances, with words and deeds of kindness. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have a license for you. And also on behalf, uh, as a sign of your duty as a, uh, as a licensed minister, your mother has something for you now. Photo off. On behalf of the deacons and your church family, children of the world. I'm, I'm, I'm another gift. Oh. oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> In a world of electronics and busyness, it seems inappropriate to give you a journal, a prayer journal. But God said, be still and know I am God. Yep. Write it in your journal. Take time for yourself. Thank you very much. Good. Yeah. As we extend, extend the right hand of fellowship to Sarah, we invite you all to join us afterwards for coffee hour in honor of her licensure as a minister among us. Congratulations. Is this your list? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, there might be there are four copies and some of you to be sure. So she's one. <laughs> Have you met? <laughs> It's a good time if you be seated. If you were like us, and sometimes uh, this is a little difficult for you, it doesn't happen to anybody else. Just make sure you get them all except ready to go. Kind of helps. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, as we gather before this table, we are reminded that it represents that fulcrum in world history. We're all changed. The offering of your suffering servant to redeem dying humanity. And as we approach this sacred moment. We want to do so with clean hands. We want to do so with your grace preparing us to receive such a sacred moment and sacred objects. And so in a time of silence, we pray your spirit sweep through us and cause us to examine ourselves and confess our sin. Oh.
Almighty Father, we recognize that in word and deed, in things done and things left undone, we have failed to be for you whom we ought to be. We need you. Our hope is in Christ alone. And so we ask that you might cleanse us. For you only need to say the word and we shall be made whole. And we thank you for your promise that says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah to you, our Lord God, for your forgiveness and grace. Now would you take this bread and this cup, each that we might have before us, even those who gather with us remotely, that whichever elements are before us, you might so dwell within them that they might become the spiritual body and blood of our Lord, that they might become channels of your grace, of your Holy Spirit, that we in turn might be such to this world. Consecrate the elements and us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to take the wafer. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus, while he was at supper with his disciples, took bread, and after giving thanks for it, he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, this body, this bread is my body, broken for you. Eat this, every one of you, in remembrance of me. Take and eat. After the supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood given to you. Do this, or take and drink in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Now, please rise and join us with the prayer of thanksgiving. Now come, all you who are loved by God. Hear his call to serve others as he has served you. Hear his plan to rescue the world. Join the community of those who follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Lord God of world-changing love, we thank you for this meal and for welcoming us to your table. We remember that we are your children and that you have called us to share your love with everyone we meet. Help us to receive your life, walk in your strength, and follow your ways every moment of our lives. Amen. Please remain standing. And we'll join together singing, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
we crown you the Lord of life, the Lord of love, the Lord of years. We give you honor and sole place of priority as the one from whom help, hope and help comes for our time and all times. Send us forth in the power of your Holy Spirit to love and serve you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.